So a very good afternoon to all uh, present in today's webinar. This is the 10th in the series of webinar that we are we've been organizing under the Ages of Neris, which is a Northeast Regional Entrepreneurship and Startup Summit. Today's webinar is on handloom and textile, the theme being sustainable fashion in respect of COVID-19. Uh, before we proceed further and uh, introduce our panel members, we have six distinguished panel members here with us today, along with the moderator, Hasina Karpi. Before I introduce them, I would like to request our director, Dr. Abhijit Sharma, to kindly share a few things about, a little bit about IE and also about what NERIS is all about. Over to you. Okay, I think he has not joined in. Maybe he's going to join in a few minutes. Uh, till then, yeah. Uh, he hasn't joined in actually. Yeah. Not joined in, okay. okay. Till the time that he joins in, let me start, you know, uh, this uh, webinar, as you are all aware, uh, NERIS is a part of uh, an initiative which Indian Institute of Entrepreneurship had taken uh, to, you know, if I do, you know, give some sort of a grant fund for startups and entrepreneurs of this region, because most of the time we found that the major problem startups have is in having a proof of concept. Now, proof of concept is something which no one funds. And most of our entrepreneurs, since the entrepreneurial ecosystem is just starting to emerge, we thought that, you know, this would be the right platform when we can, people pitch their ideas. So we had about uh, 1,500 people who had registered from all over Northeast, out of which 695 who had filled in their forms. So we had a round of a selection process going down to each and every state capital in which 200 were selected. And out of the 200, we've selected about 50 now. Now, 50 people who are uh, who have already given their business ideas. We'll be having their pitching session from 1st of June here. And then we'll be selecting 30 out of the 50. So this 30, we'll be getting a grant of five lakhs each. And as a part of the final, final summit, which we were planning uh, in uh, March itself, we thought that we would also highlight few sectors which have relevance to Northeast. And accordingly, we identified eight sectors which has a lot of you know, scope in Northeastern region. And we were supposed to have uh, seminars on each of these topics. So now in the absence of a physical summit, as a digital mode, we have gone into uh, organizing seminars. Now I see uh, uh, Dr. Abhijit Sharma joining in. I request him to just share a few thoughts uh, with the audience. Yes. Huh. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we are all online, and I think technology sometimes can be a problem. Uh, this is one of those times. Uh, so anyway, I could get in uh, quickly now, at least to begin the summit. Uh, like Suparna said, uh, I has been uh, involved with entrepreneurship uh, right from the day it started, in inception, that is 1994, uh, with different segments. And at different stages, it has been also innovating, uh, working with uh, grassroots entrepreneurs to what we call as clusters, etc. A large number of them has been with textiles and handloom. So some experience gathered. Uh, and of course, uh, that's something that we take forward. Uh, but uh, for this particular segment, which is a new segment, uh, guys who are trying to disrupt the environment, uh, I mean, the, the economic space uh, through innovations, through technology. Uh, we have uh, the, I think, uh, Shibana did share about Neris. Did you share about Neris a little? I did share about a little bit about okay, how fine, we went fine. about so, it. So, okay, I think so. You know, I think for the rest of the panelists, you are aware of it. Just one more element I would like to add is that we have we have been associated with Pina, uh, the industry body, um, who's been associated with us on this. And uh, NEC has sponsored this, uh, Northeastern Council. Uh, fortunately, I think they're thinking of coming back again. I think thanks to that, uh, we are looking at what we call as beginning or building up the funnel for this new group of entrepreneurs. Because as you all know, there is no money or no, no support at the beginning of the enterprise. Once it sets up, others come in. So we are there at the beginning, and uh, this is the one of the end result of NERIS is giving them a five lakh grant. But that's not all. We are also doing handholding support, and one of these elements is also sharing knowledge. Uh, this happens to be under that ambit, uh, thanks to Hasina, who's uh, collaborating with us with this impulse, uh, Northeast, and uh, we are very very thankful that they are there with us. 
uh, we had an earlier um, summit or webinar which was very very successful i'm sure this is also going to be equally successful as we go forward uh, i look forward to hearing from all the experts which are around i mean i see a galaxy of them uh, so with this a uh, few words we welcome you again and hope we have a nice time in this next one one or two hours back to you shepana thank you thank you so much um so i before handing today's session we i'm extremely grateful to hasina for you know actually impulse social enterprise for being our accelerating partner for this particular webinar and a support that you know impulse has been giving to us in terms of not only um, identifying people who with the right but also in deciding on what topic to be decided and so we in fact we propose to go forward on further collaborative initiatives with impulse social enterprise in future too now today's session again i would again specially thank hasina for agreeing to moderate this entire session we have as i mentioned we have six speakers with us and before handing over to hasina i would just quickly like to welcome each and every panelist who is here we have with us dr kostav sengupta kostav sengupta is associate professor in design at the national institute of fashion technology and principal investigator of vision next insights lab having an experience of 20 years dr sengupta is a youth marketing expert fashion trend analyst design mentor an ai enthusiast futurist color psychologist and an award winning academician welcome um, dr sengupta to in, in our midst next i would like to introduce uh, rajat arora Rajat Arora is the manager of policy programs at Facebook, leading economic growth programs such as She Means Business, Digital Beti in par partnership with CSC Academy, Academy and Goal, which is go going online as leaders in partnership with Ministry of Travel Affairs. Rajat Arora has been a support even in the earlier textile, and I think one of the major things which we will be requiring in future is how women go about marketing digitally, and Facebook definitely becomes a big help in this. And I'm sure the participants are going to learn a lot through this his experience sharing. Uh, I would next like to introduce um, Anjali Sharma. Anjali Sharma is a founder of French Curve and a Chota Bacha. Her experience of working in the apparel and fashion industry can be stated since 1989 she has a decade of faculty ship in nift and a senior design as a senior design faculty so we, you know when we have a mix of academic and education of for international relations she has a unique and diverse experience in intersection between education technology and arts in europe us and asia jessica had initiated directed and curated google arts and culture project welcome jessica to our midst then next we have uh, saurav malhotra so saurav malhotra is the co-founder and designer of rural futures framework for balipara foundation sort of applies human centered design for conservation and believes that humans lie at the center of any conservation program so welcome sort of amongst our midst we also have with us omi gurung popularly known as the green man of sikkim omi gurung is a well known fashion designer and a social entrepreneur from northeast india he is a founder of oh my india and owner of green dantok boutique welcome om i don't know whether he's still connected but i i think uh, welcome omi gurung for being agreeing to be with us and finally before handing over to hasina i would like to introduce hasina we all know hasina hasina tarbi an ashoka fellow and aspen ili fellow is a founder and managing director of impulse social enterprises and founder chair of board of impulse ngo network for 30 years now she has been working to provide sustainable livelihood in a safe environment for women and children she is a trainer motivational speaker and author and a poet Uh, Hasina Karbi has gained a multi-sector expertise, including leadership and institutional management, human rights, livelihood and rural development, anti-human trafficking, migration, gender-based violence, child rights, etc. She has received many prestigious awards. Um, so over to you, Hasina. But before, just before, just one second before that, I would like to introduce the team behind uh, Neris. Uh, we have uh, Amitav Datta. Uh, who's been working amitav datta as a project head we have anusia mahanta 
who are these are the people actually behind Neris, Sagar Kumar, and of course Namrata, who's helping us to you know coordinate this particular show. So welcome once again, all of you, and over to you, Hasina. Thank you, Dr. Shirpana. Uh, before I start, I think I'll just take uh, from where uh, Dr. Abhijit Sharma, the director of Indian Institute of Entrepreneurship, mentioned that the whole idea of NERIS, uh, when the whole idea conceptualized at Indian Institute of Entrepreneurship and when Dr. Shipana came on board to discuss uh, the whole initiative, we at Impulse Social Enterprises uh, felt that this initiative can take on to a next level if we partner in terms of collaborating the whole ecosystem and also collaborating the learning experiences and knowledge that we had over the years. Realizing that Indian Institute of Entrepreneurship has been an institution that has been there for almost 30 years now, engaging in developing new entrepreneurs, training grassroots entrepreneurs, and also bringing the ecosystem of the craft and textile industry in the region. We at Impulse Social Enterprises, being a 13 years old institution, which is a hybrid model of Impulse NGO network, has come about when we believe that if we have to prevent unsafe migration, the need of the hour was that capitalizing on local artisans and textile, which is the richness of the region. With that, we created a hybrid social enterprise, which is called the Impulse Social Enterprise, and also bring about a brand called Impulse Empower from the region. And we work with almost 30,000 artisans across the Northeast of India through the Impulse NGO network. But through the Impulse Social Enterprises, we have brought together skilled entrepreneurs who are women, who are weaving from home, who we have centralized raw material distribution, engaging them to restore in an ecosystem of weaving, the traditional weave, the traditional woven uh, textile that is rich in the region, and also telling a story of the tribe that they represent. We work across the eight states. We work through our partners. In fact, many of them have joined us in this webinar today. And we are also working deeply that if we give the power of entrepreneurship to women at the grassroots and market access, which is actually very sustainable, then we are seeing unsafe migration being reduced. With that, also looking at the ecosystem that we do not have to mechanize, mechanize all the weaving that is taking place in the region, but we also have to see that and the whole environment, it's a very important part. And women weaving from home, uplifting of the economy is the necessity. And with that, looking at post-COVID and during the lockdown, the richness and the weaving that continue to happen, we need to see a new window opening on how we can recapitalize that and see how the environment, which is, we often talk about sustainability in terms of fashion, but it is not about keeping the climate change and environment into perspective, but also bringing creativity and innovation in a way that the fashion market is still viable, leading to various ranges of fashion product. We at Impulse Social Enterprises work with a range of designers. In fact, we have most of them joining us today too, like Poi himself from Delhi, who is recreating this innovation. We have Mitali and many others. And that a range of speakers today that will be sharing with all of you, what is sustainable fashion? How do we encourage smart shopping, wherein the consumer are more conscious and responsible and what they are purchasing and how will it affect the ecosystem? This is what this whole webinar is all, today, is all about today. Without delaying time, I would like to call upon uh, Mr. Saurav Malhotra, who will be speaking on craft and textile uh, towards livelihood conservation for sustainable post-COVID. Like he has been introduced by Dr. Shripana, he is the co-founder and designer of Rural Future Framework of the Balipara Foundation. Over to you, Saurav. Thank you so much, Hasina. Hope I'm audible and visible and that technology is in support. Uh, so th thanks a lot, IIE, Neris, Namrata, Hasina, everyone behind the scenes for, for actually putting this great show together. I think I, think I probably share a, quite a different background as compared to many of the other panelists here, as uh, most of our work is to do with the environment. We have been in the space of textiles and crafts over the last few years, but we've been in the environment space much, much longer. 
And the more time we spend in the textile space, the more we realize how these two spheres are intricately linked and how partnership can really form the basis of recovery from COVID-19. Um, so I think, I think for most of us, COVID-19 has been a full immersion in the environmental crisis. Many of us who were not convinced by the obvious facts of climate change, this really is a very, very short preview for what is in store for us in the future. There are a few things that COVID-19 has taught us about the environment and about the way the economy works. But before I talk about uh, a recovery plan from COVID-19, I'll just like to share a few more points from our personal experience on sustainability. You know, so we've all been talking about sustainability for a long time, you know, for at least 10 years now. And sustainability is a term that's quite often industrialized nowadays. And we talk about sustainability in terms of having steady income, fair amount of income distribution, and also a distribution of material wealth amongst all the people involved in the value chain. But if we look at textile, for example, like for India, still cotton from the basis of our textiles, right? But cotton still dominates the market as a major, major, major textile source the world over. If you look at how cotton comes, so let's, let's talk about the value chain of sustainability from the seed till you have the garment with you, right? So, so you need cotton seed to, to grow the plant, which will then give you the cotton. There are seeds, most of the seeds that are currently being grown in India are actually imported genetically modified seeds, which are ruining our soil and they're ruining our biodiversity. There, there is data which would suggest that uh, the amount of water that, that's been consumed by genetically modified cotton in India is enough to supply water to all the people who've got no water to drink. There is enough evidence to prove the fact that soil growing genetically modified cotton takes at least three years to recover completely. And also the negative impact that this has on the biodiversity of the area. So if you look at the wealth of nature, talking about the wealth of nature is very, very important to understanding what sustainability really means. So if you're comparing the cost of a garment, our urge to the world would be to look at the costing of a garment from the seed till the garment is made. So if you were to adjust the price of your garment to look at the cost of, of recovering soil, the cost of recovering the water table, the cost of recovering the biodiversity of the area, the cost of this fast, fast fashion garment would actually go up by quite a few notches and, and we are not even done yet. Next up, you look at the, the places where these garments are made. These are either handmade or they're factory made. If they're factory made, what energy does your factory run on? What kind of chemicals are you using in your factory? If you were to neutralize the cost of nature damage into this fast fashion garment made in a factory, either in Chennai or in Dhaka or in Vietnam, the cost of your garment again goes up by quite, quite a few notches. If you look at the retail mechanisms or the links to consumers, how is this done and what is the amount of carbon that, that is being spent in getting your garment from Dhaka to New York, right? So, so these are all factors that must be accounted for in the fast fashion industry. If these are accounted for in the fast fashion industry, the cost of a garment produced by some of the world's largest fast fashion dealers, I'm not gonna take any names here, would be about 60% more than a garment made from locally available cotton dyed naturally and handmade. So I think the one urge, so we all have to think about the environment now because we know that environmental degradation will lead to many, many more pandemics in the future. The only way out of preventing pandemics is by ensuring that our habitats are safe and our habitats are resilient. The cost of fashion is immense on the habitat. The cost of uh, textiles is intense on, on nature, but the profits that people make by producing profits is immense on livelihood. And, and sustainability includes the cost that is paid to every single person in the value chain of making this whole garment. And if you would be adjusting costs of natural damage, you would by default have more profits going to the people who actually make these garments. So that was just a bit about how, how we need to rewire our thoughts on sustainability, how we need to rewire how we price our products. And ultimately, I think one great learning that COVID-19 has given us is that local economies are resilient. So throughout the time that the pandemic was on big time, we, we, we were all under lockdown. Some of us are still under some stage of a lockdown. 
we know that we are buying masks from our neighbors, making masks at home and not ordering masks coming in from Bangalore or from New Delhi or from wherever you are, right? So, so local economies tend to go on, local economies for food tend to go on, local economies for textile goes on. I think, I think what we've really got to do to make the next big leap to sustainable fashion is to try and decolonize our imagination. I think, I think one large problem with the fashion industry in India, but not just in India, I think across the world, is that we still, we still are colonized in the mind. You know, we're still not wearing, I mean, how many of us, how many of the 50 participants or the 72 participants, how many of you are actually wearing garments that were made uh, locally in your state, for example, right? I mean, I know for a fact that Hasina is, but I'm not sure, I mean, I can't even see most of you, but I, I, I'm not sure how many of you are, right? And the reason why we are not doing that is because local garments have not been made accessible. I live in Guwahati, and it is much easier for me to go and buy a, a t-shirt, which is a fast fashion t-shirt, than to buy a t-shirt made from locally made cotton. So I think, I think that COVID-19 leads us and must lead us to a fundamental change in the way we do business, a fundamental change in which we grow things. Coming back to what we in the Balipara Foundation do and how all of this really fits in, is that all of our work is to do with the restoration of the environment. Uh, most of our projects uh, in Assam, in the Assam Bhutan border areas, Assam Arunachal Pradesh border areas, are to do with identifying pieces of degraded land, identifying communities that depend on degraded land, and starting a restoration project which begins by restoring the forest and by restoring all traditional livelihood industries, including forestry and all types of farming. We see that textile forms an integral part here because it's been a part of the culture forever. Textile, textile cultures are diminishing because of the lack of a market. Textile cultures are diminishing because most of our dependencies are on an external market. Uh, in fact, we, us and Hasina, we, we have some plans of, of actually bringing these two aspects together, of actually trying to bring the environment into textile programs and of trying to bring textile and handloom rejuvenation programs back into the environment. We really believe that uh, the economy of the northeastern part of India is inherently resilient because we already have a local economy. We have a local economy which is by default completely rural and it is run by the rural. This economy is based on the environment and all the bounties of the environment. So we must, must be able to account for environmental degradation, for environmental sustainability in the whole aspect of, of pricing of our garments and the whole aspect of redistributing material wealth and of trying to enhance the local economies for, for not just for the garments, but also for the crops and for all the other products that the environment gives us. You know, we can explore, we've been exploring models by which we can grow uh, local cotton or desi cotton, as we call it, in the middle of forests, you know, and this is a more sustainable way of actually growing your fabric in your backyard. So these were some of some of our thoughts on the environment. I think I think I'd like to conclude uh, the 10 minutes by pointing out that, you know, COVID-19 has been fantastic for sustainability because people who have never thought about sustainability now have to think about sustainability. You've got to bring in measures of sustainability into whatever business, textile and craft is just one such business, which, which will be impacted either positively or negatively based on the decisions that we all collectively take. And the fact that we've got to keep the environment at the center of any kind of business that we do, especially a business which depends on natural growth, which is textile and silk and craft, so intricately linked to the environment will be really crucial in a recovery from COVID. Building local economies will be our only way out because they are the only kind of economies which are resilient. Uh, I'd be happy to have any questions and uh, over to you, Hapina. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Saurav Malhotra. I think you rightly said that the common responsibility and the purchasing power is we need to support sustainability ecosystem by being more conscious customer. And I think when we talk about conscious customers, about looking what locally produced product are, not just from a textile where the yarn come from outside the border or from yeah. other states, yeah. but yeah. growing cotton or growing yeah. our own yarn within yeah. the whole you know, communities. I mean, we'd have to have this distribution channel of community, the farmers yeah. who are yeah. growing cotton and also yeah. the weavers who are weaving the cotton 
and spinning in the region itself. That is called sustainability as what Saurabh Malhotra has mentioned. Now, uh, I also would like to mention to all the uh, participants, if you can put, uh, you know, uh, you can mute because so that it will be much more clearer. And if you have any question, uh, you can send question into the chat box. So as we go with the next speaker, uh, uh, I mean, our, our speaker was completed, we'll look into it and we'll open, uh, you know, in answering those questions, which is there in the chat box. Uh, with that, I would like to call upon our next uh, speaker, Omi Gurung. Uh, he has been, uh, I mean, he's well known as being the green man of Sikkim. And he is also a fashion designer, a social entrepreneur, as Dr. Shipana has already introduced him. We have a video that is recorded of what he wants to share with all the participants, but he's also online. Because of the internet connectivity, we don't want a disruption, so he had done a pre-recording. So Namrata, over to you to on the video of uh, Omi. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma Namaste. Did you know that fashion industry is the second most polluting industry in the world and fashion can save the environment? Today, the issue faced by the fashion industry is at its worst. We are facing enormous carbon dioxide emission, uh, air, Namaste. Did you know that fashion industry is the second most polluting industry in the world and fashion can save the environment? Um, can we move on to the next speaker, please? Because we're having some technical issues here. Uh, hello, hello, uh, all the participants. Yeah. We will move on to the next speaker for now because uh, we are having a little bit of a technical to show the video. But I would like to invite upon uh, Dr. Kaustav Sen Gupta, who will be speaking on trends and impact of COVID, sustainable fashion and product design. Uh, he is being introduced already by um, Dr. Shipana and uh, he is basically an associate professor in design at the National Institute of Fashion Technology and the principal investigator of Vision Next Insight Lab uh, and looks after youth marketing expert, a fashion trend analyst. Over to you, Dr. Costa uh, Sengupta. Okay, can you see the screen? Can the screen, is it the screen visible? Okay, thank you. That's the new norm, you know, I mean, you have to see a sign to know whether you are knowing or not. So let's move on. Uh, we are going to talk about the impact of post COVID-19. I'll try to go fast and try to understand it because there's a time limit. Uh, so this is what India is. Uh, my approach will be towards consumer. I'm not going to talk about uh, the designer's perspective because uh, I think a designer should know what the consumer is looking forward. So I'll give you a perspective of what consumer is looking forward at this moment and it might be something interesting for you. 
It's very interesting space. India, we have around more than 5,500 towns and more than six lakh villages. A big number to proceed. But beyond that, uh, our who are our consumers at this? Because by 2020 and 2021, we'll be the youngest country in the world. And that is going to impact because if you see that whatever we are seeing in social media is basically posted by them who's in that age group. But the decisions, the policy decisions are being taken by someone who's 50 plus. So there's a paradox of who's actually looking forward and who's actually giving the money. Now there's an absolute paradox in this domain. So let's take it up forward. We have been talking about fear and we are also going to talk about the un unexpected and that's what actually the consumers are looking forward. So if we go through this, we are going to report for this particular report. It's called Infometer. We have published it three days back. And this is fascinating because I'll just give you some data which might help you in business because more than 78% uh, you'd say that lockdown being good to them because it helped them to improve the relationship. This is good because also they say that this is going to impact for them at long. And this is also showing that they are not going to be involved in kind of a, a panic buying or kind of a, a, we call it them as a, you know, coming out of lockdown buying. That's not going to happen in India. And the data says this. If you move forward, we are going to talk about three large mindsets. It might be helping you to understand what kind of type of consumers we are facing. Uh, we had six, but we cut down to three because we have a time limit. So you can give a glimpse of what mindsets we are talking about. So first mindset we are talking about are a group of individuals called them seeker. So the seekers are them who basically looks for things to know. So seekers will be a group like this. And you must be knowing this in social media that individuals are leaving what they were actually doing and started doing something which they left in their childhood. That's the picture what Karina Kapoor posted that Saif Ali Khan is painting. Have you ever seen Sunny Leone painting? Right. So seekers will be a group of consumers who like to get engaged with the kind of activities what they can get out of this product. So they'll be artistic, they'll be physically conscious, they'll be the one who will look for product to help them out in this way. How it happens? Uh, you know already the genes are moving at home. So those lot of individuals who are starting to download the apps and going to use them for home gym. And how it's going to impact us? Because you know this kind of furniture is going to come. Because these are all multi-use products. The products where they can use as a gym and a table. You know, it's a multifaceted. So individuals will not spend a lot of money to buy individual products. Like I am not going to buy a gym equipment, but I'm going to buy a furniture which will help me in gymming. How? The same furniture can be also converted into a coffee table. See this picture. And this is exactly what happens. And this is where the consumers are looking forward from the designers to find out solutions. So your design has to be multifaceted. It cannot be gym equipment. It is not going to work. A gym equipment which helps you to do different things. Uh, the consumers will try to portray themselves as artistic. There's a new kind of a wall painting is coming. It's a line. It looks like a wall color, which is like a watercolor, but this is a patch painting. Uh, this kind of paintings are coming in as a wall color. But when it comes to the products, there are a lot of collaborations what is going to happen. So you cannot design an individual product. Take it for writing that collaboration is the next design theory. You have to collaborate with others. So somebody is good in textiles, kindly collaborate with them to make a fashion design or a fashion garment. If somebody is good in graphics, collaborate with them to create a graphics. You cannot become a graphic designer and a fashion designer together. This is what Powerpoff is doing. So Powerpoff is collaborating with Hyperfly to come out with this kind of garments. The graphics are done by Powerpoff and the garment actually is being made by the Hyperfly brand. This is collaboration and this is how the designs are going to move under seekers. Uh, they'll be looking forward for interesting childlike products, but serious products. For example, this brand called Jump From Paper, they mix bags, which actually looks like animation. Uh, these are all actual bags, utility bags for adults, not for children. Uh, these are the products everybody will look forward to show a different image, a happy image outside. There'll be a lot of floral motifs coming in. Take it for writing that the florals are going to come, but florals will not come as flowers. They'll be coming out as artworks. They'll be coming out as patchworks, embroideries, whatever work you are doing, kindly try to incorporate florals because florals brings up the mood that has happened after the World War and that is going to happen after this lockdown also. Uh, abstract florals are going to come. Abstract florals which will look like geometric pattern, looks nice, but not actually floral. So these are the things which are going to come. 
a lot of mushroom prints will be coming. So if you are interested in prints, if you are interested in graphics, then mushroom is a very important element which is going to come because mushroom comes when we look for a brighter time, when we look for folklores, when we look for mythology, and this is the right time to look for something better. A uh, lot of graphics are coming in mushroom, a lot of embroideries are going to come in mushroom. So if you are into embroidery, think about mushroom. Some of the brands who's already doing it. Uh, there are a lot of environment friendly products. I will not say a uh, sustainable product because these are the products which will help someone to be uh, less polluted. So this is a t-shirt which is called repair t-shirt where they have a pocket to keep an element to absorb pollution. So this is the first pollution absorbing t-shirt. It's not an eco-friendly t-shirt, but it allows an individual to be safe. A lot of safeguarding products are going to come to protect individuals. So they will not look forward for a product to safeguard others, but safeguard themselves. Uh, for example, a very interesting uh, product is this one. If this t-shirt changes the color of the pattern with the environment, that means the kind of a carbon monoxide in the air, the print color change. And this is an absolutely gorgeous way to present your design. So design is no more going to be only aesthetics. Just forget the time that you are just making a nice drawing for the sake of drawing. Right? Design is going to be implemented with the consciousness of a human being's existence. And that's what is going to sustain after this. A lot of truthful products are going to come. So because truthfulness is what everyone is looking forward. If this shoe is being made, there is a carbon footprint printed on the shoe. How much carbon footprint is being made or produced by making this shoe? Be truthful. If you have used plastic, write down that you have used plastic. There's no harm in telling that you have used plastic. Tell that. Telling is more important. That's what consumer looks forward. Uh, there will be very interesting. If you think that this uh, 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 mask is going to be a fad, no, it's not going to be a fad. This is going to be our accessories. Uh, the accessories, how we use a purse, mask is going to be because we have already seen in Korea, everybody is used to it, mask. And when it comes to mask, please go for innovations because we are looking forward for smaller innovations. Like a mask can be owned for a longer duration. Can you do that? Can you create a mask which can be owned for a longer duration? A simple solution is this. It's not going to affect the ear. And simple solution is this, where there is a small buckle attached to it. Think about smaller solutions even for the mask. And engineering in mask is very important. We all know fabric mask cannot protect us from the virus. So let us forget that type. Think about proper health conscious products. Uh, we are going to come down to other consum consumer mindset. It's called rejuvenism. Uh, the rejuvenists will be looking forward to the products to get refreshed. A refreshing product is very important at this moment because mental stress and mental health is something which is getting affected. So if you're talking about in this category, you're thinking about a new product category where the brands will work on the last season's product and relaunch it. And this is being already done. So the, what they are doing, they are taking the older product which is not sold during Corona's uh, lockdown. They are reworking on those garments and relaunching it. So there will be no season. At least for one year, there will be no season. There will be a time and they will launch the product. So think about reproducing existing products, giving a reframe, giving a new story, launch it back again. And that's what actually goes to a sustainability. Not producing more, but working on the existing products. And it can go in a different direction because... Uh, this garment can have a good story. You can attach a small uh, a tag saying that it's a renewed garment. And the, uh, the brand called North Face, North Face is doing it. North Face is already launching their existing products back again in the market. And you can do that. Uh, interesting products as this is going to come. I, 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 must, uh, I know that you will know this brand called Bayer Necessities. It's a basic simple brand which never uses a plastic as a bottle. And it creates all the materials. So what you are seeing in the glass bottle is basically a, tooth, uh, a, a toothpaste available in a bottle. So think about a new packaging solution. Toothpaste need not come only in tube. It can still come in a bottle. And these are the solutions everybody is looking forward under division germination. So they want to go back to the normality, but in a different way. Uh, this is a very interesting collaboration. So you can think about collaborations where you are collaborating with a brand and giving a life of their existence. Face is doing, they are starting a workshop, and the workshop is not by a North Face, North Face is a brand. It's done by a, a company called the Renewal Workshop. So the Renewal Workshop has tied up with North Face. If North Face products are getting damaged, the consumer can bring it to Renewal Workshop and rework on it 
or bring it in a new phase. And this collaboration is the things what we will think about sustainability after the lockdown. And we'll exist with this. This is going to be a big trend in the longer duration. I think about creating new products from existing products. And there's a very interesting tie up what Nike is doing. Nike is actually tying up with individuals who have as a jersey, a sports jersey of uh, uh, brands. And then church is actually making, church of the hand is actually making masks out of those jerseys. What we can do with the jersey, the jersey can be just kept at home because you are not going to play. But the jersey can be converted into a mask and the mask can go out. So this kind of a collaboration to reframe of an existing product is something you can look at. And this is something which you can actually look at. There's a new terminology, please note down a new terminology called mending. Uh, as a sustainable designer, mending is something which everybody is looking for. Mending is actually teaching individuals how to give a better life to their existing product, uh, how to stitch or how to repair the garments. Repairing is going to be the next trend. Individuals are not going to buy a new product. They are going to give a new life of existing product. And that's where your sustainability comes in. How to mend it with well. There's a designer called Molly Martin. What Molly Martin is doing, Molly is actually taking workshops, a serious webinar, where Molly is teaching individuals how to mend their existing products. And this can be, again, a very interesting approach what our designers can take to teach individuals how to repair a garment at home and teach individuals how to create a new interesting motif in the garment. And this can be something interesting you can do. Sharing is more important at this moment. Uh, a new approach of dyeing is coming. Natsa is creating dye out of bacteria. That means she is not using any chemicals. She is not using even a natural dye, but she is using bacteria to dye the garment. We call them staining the garment, and the garment looks fabulous. You can check about it. This looks like a, a tie and dye, but these are all done by bacteria. So a new approach towards sustainability is coming. It's no more using a bio dye. It's using bio design. There's a new approach of bio design where an individual is actually tying up with an organ or a, a, a small organic element to create a dye. And that's what is very important at this moment. Uh, these are new materials which are being launched. These are all made in mushroom. These are the sustainable uh, replacement of leather. So a mushroom leather is the new trend. You must be having it nearby your place. Somebody must be doing it. I know one who is doing it in Bangalore, but you must be having it at your place. So mushroom leather is something which everybody is looking forward and that can be a replacement. So find out the replacement of an existing material. Cork is no more sustainable. This is a very interesting material, it's called seaweed. And seaweed is giving a new material called bioplastic. So bioplastic is what we are thinking of replacement as plastic. And this is going to come at a large volume at different spaces. Uh, bioplastic is also going to be replaced with another material called seaweed furniture. This is a moldable material which has connected. So you can have a lot of ponds. I know that you have created a lot. You have a lot of weeds at your own. Try to work with the locals to create this material. And this material is moldable, absolutely sustainable, and it's not going to damage the environment because it's a natural material. So a seaweed or the weeds can be the next material to replace paper. Because we know paper is basically by creating, cutting off the trees. Uh, Interesting elements as this is going to add in design. I call it as a local design. It's very hyper-local, as Sora was talking about. Hyper-local should be the next trend. Uh, for example, this beautiful bottle is made in Sikkim. We all know that. It's a water bottle. Everybody look for a local solution for the products. We are not looking forward for an imported product because the import is still a long journey. I don't know when the import is open or the mindset is going to change. This is what we are looking for. We're looking forward for the local sustainable solutions. Uh, like jewelry is made out of bamboo. The beautiful jewelry is made out of bamboo, which can be done in Northeast at large. Uh, very interesting bamboo fabrics. These are very interesting bamboo fabrics uh, uh, made in Tirupur, uh, mixed with Lycra. Uh, this can be used as a neat, and these are made out of bamboo fiber. Can we look forward for the designers to work in? Uh, or an initiative as this. This is a very interesting initiative. I like this product. This is called Pool. Pool is the name of a brand which makes flower. This pool is a very interesting product because they make in, uh, uh, incense sticks out of all the flowers thrown out from the temple. Uh, they have set up a local scenario where the temple uh, flowers are actually going back to the villagers who convert them into incense sticks. 
So local solution of the products we are looking forward as part of it. Uh, this is a very interesting initiative. It's in Africa. The local uh, uh, social community collects all the shoes and then the slippers being thrown off from the sea. They collect them and convert them beautiful products to be spread at home. Uh, this kind of initiatives are something which we are looking for on sustainable design. Something local, something cross-body, and it's a circular economy as part. Black clay is going to come back. I know black clay is a very important product from Northeast. Uh, uh, black clay is going to be a very important product for the next season because we are not going to use dyes. We are actually using the clay as it is. And it's very local and very stable. Uh, black clay is also available in Nizamabad in UP. So there are two places in India where you can get black clay materials. It's not dyed, it's not colored, it's a clay which looks black. Uh, this is a very interesting brand called Malai. Malai is in Kerala. Uh, this is a couple who makes this product. Malai is made out of coconut shells. So what they are doing, they're using coconut shells and husks to create a material which can be converted into a bags and shoes and all those things. So these are very interesting solutions to look at as part. Uh, we come back to the mindset called homos. Uh, we also know that this is the time when we understood home is a new sanctuary. And we understood home is actually much safer than even hospital. Uh, this is how home is supposed to be, and this is what everybody is doing at home. There are home gardens happening. Uh, we know people are doing home in five feet. So if you are an accessory designer, you can look for home gardens. Celebrities are doing home gardens. And there are a lot of products which they will require to do homes. So pots, uh, ceramic pots, terracotta pots, metal pots, and these are the things which individuals will buy. And you must be actually focusing on creating these products, absolutely beautiful pots. And this can be also uh, technically good because there are elements like this pot. This is a very interesting pot. I like this one because it's not only a, a lighting arrangement, it's also a salad which grows inside the light. It's a very sustainable joined product where you can get fresh salad out of the light and the light is actually made in terracotta, nothing else. So this kind of solutions we are looking forward from the designers. It's absolutely not expensive. It's beautiful and then it's sustainable. And home solutions are something which we are looking forward here. Uh, when we talk about home, we are also talking about interesting products as this. This is not something which is sustainable, but this is what is happening now. Uh, individuals are buying robots to clean the houses. Almost this is going to replace the housemates because you can actually control this repo, uh, robot by a mobile phone. It's not expensive. It's around 25,000 bucks. Just imagine the salary of a uh, housemate for uh, yeah, you know, it's almost similar. So this kind of robots, we call them micro robots, are coming in our life. It works as a security guard, it works as cleaning the home, and you can just type iRobot and you will find that iRobot in uh, Amazon. You can actually buy iRobot from Amazon. It's available and it's the, what I was showing is actually from a screen capture from a, one of my friend's page. Uh, interestingly, you can also focus on products designed for home office. And this is what we are looking for. So if you see in your right side, you will see all those products made out of eco-friendly material, left side made out of plastic, but we require both of them at home. We require products for home office, and that's very important. In fact, somebody has made this app. You can try this app. This app gives a sound, which gives you a feel of being at office. It says, I miss the office. And you can download this app, which actually gives you an environment of office at home. And people have gone down to that level and individuals are doing it. There's a new terminology called the above the keyboard dressing. And if you are a fashion designer, kindly look at it because above the keyboard dressing is going to be very popular. And this is what the designers are going to look at. Uh, the products which will be just own up and you can wrap it up and sit for your conference or a webinar. And this is what we are looking forward. Above the keyboard dressing is something which we are looking forward. But we are also looking forward for a lot of bright colors because bright colors are very important for us. And the brightness is going to increase. It's going to happen everywhere. Right from refurbishing of existing furniture. You can do this. Tell them to give the furniture back to you. You walk on the furniture and hand it over. Don't tell them to buy a new furniture. Unless you are adding value to that furniture. This can be another approach. And this is absolutely sustainable. This looks beautiful. Uh, also, very bright and colorful products are coming in. Like this band, which is very simple home uh, gym comes in bright colors. And then this is what is adding color. Just imagine this scene in Instagram picture. This looks beautiful. 
If you are into ceramics, look for bright ceramics because everybody is going to buy bright color ceramics, and everybody is going to do that. This is by Anthropology, and then a new product segment is coming called Bleach. You can look at Bleach because everybody is looking forward for something interesting in the product segment like this one. These are all bleached product. This looks abstract, but this looks interesting. You have to stay at home for longer duration. You need something interesting. Consumers will look forward for interesting products. These are all bleached furnitures, and these are real. This is not Photoshop. These are real furniture, bleached one, and you will look forward for this kind of furnitures a lot. You will also look forward for this product because consumers are going to look forward for the solutions to rework on their garbages. They will look forward for a sustainable solution for the garbage. So garbage bag is something, and garbage bin is something. They will definitely buy a garbage bin, especially for the compost bin as this. This is from a, a brand. Both of them are belonging to two brands. You can come out with your own solution, and this is what people are going to buy at large. So we talked about three basic segments, uh, three consumer segments. These are the three segments. Uh, these are the basic colors. If you are a designer working on color, these are the basic colors. We are going to have a group of comfort colors in your left side, which looks fascinating pastel. We have a bit of brighter tone in the middle, and we will have a gray tone, which will balance all these colors. There will be grays and blacks a lot. In this season, so these are the three tones. As such, you will also have a little bit of metallic to touch up on. Uh, my inspiration for the season will be Dushan Dushan Studio. Uh, it's absolute gorgeous studio. If you are looking for it for a studio, look at Dushan Dushan Studio. It's bright yet monochromatic and balanced. So this is basically showing the consumer mindset at this moment. We require this balance as part of it. Uh, my, uh, you can find me at anywhere. Just type my name. You will get in Google. Can catch me in places. All the data is what you are seeing. We are working on something called Vision Next. Vision Next is the first indigenous fashion forecasting what we are going to launch from NIFT under Government of India. It's a funded project from Government of India, and it's a free to all project. So if you are looking for a for trend forecasting report for India, you can touch up on to us. Thank you. I hope I have not eaten on someone's timing. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Dr. Kostov. I think uh, Sen Gupta, those are amazing uh, innovation that we have 74 participants who are actually uh, listening to this webinar. And many of them are designers and entrepreneurs working in this ecosystem. I'm sure that those inputs that you provide, what is the way forward post COVID when it comes to market and how could they think about sustainability and how sustainability will have a new meaning altogether when you start reusing old stuff. And when it comes to, I think was something very important that you mentioned, uh, which talks about design has to be multiple usage post COVID. Collaboration and design is the next mantra, which is an important element that designers works together. I think it takes back to our first speaker where Saurav Malhotra, when he mentioned that partnership is an, an important element when we talk about craft and textile. And when we talk about entrepreneurship in this ecosystem who are going to be involved, that sustainability cannot happen by one individual doing things on their own. I mean, having said that, Impulse Social Enterprise has used the same uh, method of collaboration of design. And many of our designers like Huma Hazarika who's joined in and we have Poi as well. We have many designers who work with our artisans in recreating product lines, multiplying the textile availability in the region into various product lines so that we have the sustainable you know, range of product and also maintaining the ecosystem. And it's, it's nice that our artisans from Panbari, who's also joined, uh, you know, I mean, listening and the master artisans and the team sent a message and they said that sustainability, sustainability has to be a life and a way forward that we all have to think. I think that's a very important message to all of us. Thank you so much for those amazing uh, inputs uh, that we can relook really how innovation will come uh, in a collaborated effort where designer has to work together unless we cannot have designer working in silos. We have to have partnership as what Saurav has mentioned and if you have to look at the environment as a whole. Now, without wasting time, we have our next speaker, uh, who is Rajat Malhotra. Are you already in there, Rajat?
Rajat Arora. Hello? He hasn't, he hasn't joined yet. He hasn't joined in. Ma'am, he hasn't joined yet. He hasn't joined in. Uh, he is supposed to be joining in right now. He just sent a message. So uh, I will just introduce Rajat Aurora is a manager for policy program at Facebook, leading economic growth programs such as She Mean Business. Now, Impulse Social Enterprises has partnered with Facebook and how we can actually help women in engaging into a sustainable market platform, uh, selling local product, which is sustainable. So with that, I mean, uh, it's an important partnership that Facebook is also one of the major social media platform that is widely used and small local entrepreneurs are using a lot in terms of selling the product online. Uh, if Rajan is already there, is he already in? Not yet, ma'am. Not yet. Uh, so should we just move to our next speaker? Will Anjali, would you mind to just join in first and uh, and then we will then take it over to Rajat without wasting time so that our participant will not be waiting. Is that okay? Certainly, thank you so much. Yeah. So uh, Anjali, uh, she is the founder of the French Curves and uh, her experience in working with apparel and fashion industry can be stated, you know, I mean, started since 1989. Uh, she is also a faculty, a ship at NIF, a senior design faculty, and she wear many hats of a lot of successful endeavors in her entrepreneurship journey in terms of using fashion uh, with working with local artisans. Over to you, uh, Anjali. Thank you. So I have a PPT which Namrita is going to share. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. I'm going to talk about challenges and opportunities in fashion and retail. Namrita, we can just go to the next one. So my profile, of course, is on Google and etc. But some of the finer points which are necessary for today's uh, webinar are that I am an army child and my father was extensively posted in the Northeast. So Guwahati and Assam and Arunachal Pradesh is very, very close to my heart. And when this Neris uh, invitation came in, it was extremely um, nice to accept. So thank you, um, IIE and Impulse uh, Network and the listeners. And special thanks to Namrita because she's been really doing back and forth with me on, on tech, uh, me being tech challenged. All right. So um, before I go into challenges and uh, opportunities in post-COVID era, I'd like to take a more holistic approach because we're talking about uh, or talking to rather entrepreneurs and uh, entrepreneurs in the making, which um, for me, it's important to have a very, very uh, holistic and uh, complete overview of the situation before you start talking about opportunities and or challenges. So my 30 years in uh, the garment trade, I would like to say that our generation somehow was the middleman in uh, between the industrial uh, society and the post-industrial society, which I'm going to talk about a little later. But it just so happens that we were the lucky ones who've seen the, uh, the backwaters and uh, we also have seen COVID and today's age. And therefore, uh, it's extremely important to, um, for me to sum up these two uh, topics for you. Uh, by holistic approach, I'm, I uh, mean that we need to see the history and how it pans out. And uh, if you see on my slide, I'm talking about early life civilizations. There were just civilizations or there were just civilizations in terms of wiping out or coming on. There were empires, rural, rural, rulers ruled and uh, conquered, etc., etc. And business was a very, very simple uh, way of barter system. But that's very, very old that we are talking about. Namrita, second slide, please. That carried on for centuries and then we came to industrial period, 17th, 18th century, and we see that manpower increased, machines increased, the mass production happened, 
very, very high capacity of production of mass production happened and everything went global. And what happened? Trade improved, travel improved, uh, money improved, people's lifestyles improved, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then about 50, 60 years ago, we went into post-industrial uh, society, which means that the services were really um, into the foray. Intelligence was, um, uh, I'm not talking about intelligent people, I'm talking about intelligence and artificial intelligence, which was really uh, the coveted thing. Um, information technology was coming up super, super fast. And uh, about 10 years ago, like Saurav also mentioned, we went into sustainability and handmade and conscious business ventures, which is what we are looking at post COVID. Uh, next slide, please, uh, Namrita. Now, this is what really I'm going to talk about. But before we go into that, I'd like to talk about crisis in general. And uh, everybody's talking about COVID and post-COVID and COVID-19 and Corona, etc. That's because it's really in the face. But if we talk about or look at at least 200 uh, years uh, of history, we've seen the World War One. we've seen the uh, the Great Depression, we've seen World War II, we've seen a variety of financial crises, we've seen 9-11 recently, we've seen the Gulf War, the Cold War, etc., etc. So crises come and crises go. And mankind has survived. I, uh, In terms of COVID, since it is today, we are talking about COVID and Let's just talk about COVID, but we need to also see that there are so many other global crises which are subtly happening all the time and it's not in your face. Like hunger kills more people, malaria kills more people, poverty kills more people, and that's crisis too. Coming back to the point, we will talk about challenges and opportunities. So again, to make it really, really simple and to make it understandable, we will see what are the challenges which are which COVID has presented. And one challenge which is staring in our faces is that it has uh, that we all have the same denominator. So earlier on, what used to or could happen was that you could ask your uh, colleague or you could ask uh, your boss for an advice or you could ask your guruji for an advice or etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. But right now we are just all in the same uh, waters. Nobody knows what's happening. It's an unknown sort of a thing. It's COVID is new. We don't know. Everybody's unsure. Fear factor prevails. Businesses are dipping. Cancellations are happening. Postponing. Uh, commitments are getting postponed. Cash crunch is there. Everybody's non-committal. We all know that. And retail has really, really dipped. And on these are on top of the thing that you have to survive first and then take a look at challenges later. So, uh, very frankly speaking, personally, there's only one challenge that all of us are in the same denominator, period. Let's look at the opportunities. Every challenge we know presents opportunities. So, yes, we need to reassess all our values and actions in terms of our lifestyles and in terms of our uh, work, businesses, how we deal with things. We need to reinvent dealings. Uh, very, very in your face, uh, a point would be that a brick and mortar is going to go out possibly for some time. Digital is in, e-commerce is in. All of us are on a webinar today instead of meeting face-to-face -face or a seminar, which was pre-planned. We all know that. Uh, Reimagine your contribution to the society as a business person, as a worker, as an individual, as an individual. Reset the button. Yes, sure. You need to reset the button. You have to go back, look at everything else, redo reshape the fabric of thought and definitely we need a revolution for a new system. So um, just to sum up everything, yes, we are looking at sustainable. We are looking at grassroots. Sustainable, in my opinion, is a very widely overused word, but we are sustainable would mean possibly have a business or have a work uh, environment where each stakeholder gets some sort of uh, wealth generation. And by that, I mean investors. By that, I mean uh, artisans, uh, grassroots level, people who are working, people who are selling, everybody. Businesses have to be bottom up. Businesses have to be handmade. And it's a complete circle if you see that when I was talking about five minutes ago about the barter system and people and life being very, very extremely simple, that's how 
we are going forward even though when we have a uh, uh, technology on our side and everything is uh, intelligence oriented so yes thank you sora for saying that local economies do are uh, uh, resilient and costa very rightfully said also that you need to collaborate so yes you have to find your like minded people and collaborate and uh, clusters have to develop uh, crafts have to be revived handmade is on um, entrepreneurs need to really look at or uh, take stock of the situations not today yesterday but on a larger scale and uh, move on yes i am available for more questions if you want but thank you namrita that's about it thank you so much anjali sharma you rightly said when you said that we all have the same denominator uh, so we need to reassess and reimagine our contribution to the society at textile and handicraft i think those are very 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 important words when it comes to post covid and how do we see ourselves and how does artisans working together with designers and entrepreneur create an ecosystem where we will be able to re generate production locally and also have consumption locally which is a very important element so thank you so much uh, for that and there are questions in the chat where you can have a look because i could see that uh, saurav has been answering uh, to many of the question of the participants we have around 69 participant and sending any question uh, if you could also answer them uh, before we open later uh, for a few of the summing up uh, now i would like to invite uh, i mean uh, we we already have uh, rajat arora and uh, he has joined us here now and he is from the facebook uh india office who is looking at policy change which i've already introduced before he joined in i know he's been not very well but thank you so much rajat for joining i would just like to bring in that uh the initiative by facebook as a collaboration of this whole process of neris is to relook how we can help women entrepreneurs at the ground especially in tribal population uh engage in having platforms in marketing their rural product so that they revive their economy over to you rajat so thank you very much hasina and uh, i was just listening to anjali ma'am so plus one to whatever anjali ma'am was saying this is the ground reality there are a couple of things from facebook perspective that we are trying to assess and analyze uh, just sharing some some highlights and inputs uh, in india we have more than 63 million small businesses or what we call msmes majority of these businesses are leveraging the power of technology but there is still like a substantial segment like when we talk about artisans or weavers on the ground who are not leveraging technology to the fullest uh, what do we how do we define success for them and specifically like initially whatever they were producing they used to go to their local markets the catchment area was also limited but with with covid happening there are major challenges with respect to supply chain but there are certain opportunities as well like the the rate of adoption of technology has certainly gone up and this is the sense that we are getting when we are speaking to a lot of artisans we were small businesses on the ground and and this is one of the reasons why we recently launched this project called goal which is going online as leaders the idea is very very simple how do we identify talent at the grassroots level specifically when we say grassroots level at the bottom of pyramid in 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 tribal areas what kind of role or support organizations like us can offer so when we started this entire journey it was all about upskilling people or telling them about what technology wonders can do in your life that that we we achieved little bit of success but we still felt that more needs to be done and when we started working with hasina with with impulse foundation we got to know that it's not just about upskilling people it's also about raising their level of aspiration on the ground we started working on this agenda and suddenly when we started working on this we still uh, felt that there are some major things that are yet to be done on the ground and then we came up with this entire philosophy within goal that it's not just about upskilling it's not just about aspiration but if some sort of hand holding support is given to the youth uh, uh, across tribal or rural villages then the chances of success are fairly higher that's the genesis of 
the model that we have created, which is called Gold, which is going online as leaders. In phase one, we launched this project in partnership with Niti Aayog, and we had an implementation partner on the ground. We did our studies and implementation across five states. We had 100 girls who were uh, taken as mentees, shortlisted as mentees, and we have we had uh, we were fortunate enough to get 25 mentors who were leaders from various fields who came in and started hand holding a lot of these mentees on the ground what we realized after almost 6 months was that more than 37% of those girls who got mentorship support and and access to technology uh, uh, they were able to create their small enterprises they were able to support their families at the grassroots level. Second uh, uh, thing that we saw immediately on the ground that 100% of all those audiences were now accessing not just what internet can do uh, at their at their local level, but what are other government schemes initiatives that are available, which they were initially missing out on. So access to information, access to markets, access to finance. So these are certain things which which definitely technology can play a huge role on and which can supercharge a local hyper local ecosystem uh, uh, within goal project, which is phase two. We have recently partnered with Ministry of Tribal Affairs and again, focus is to scale and we are now taking this project on to uh, 5000 mentees who again will be crowdsourced from across India. We are getting some some amazing support from various state governments as well as central government Ministry of Tribal Affairs in this case. Uh, now we are also we are inviting applications and there is this portal called goal.tribal.gov.in so uh, i would i would urge everyone to do definitely visit that portal if you are working with some artisans or weavers on the ground do ask them to apply to this portal uh, as a mentor or as a mentee uh, the shortlisted people will get a, a mentorship support some certificates also will be given from the government and Facebook site plus uh, mobile phone as well as internet will be provided in this in entire conversation for the mentors as well. Uh, this is a great opportunity to whatever wisdom you have accumulated all the ex rich experiences that you have accumulated. Can it be used to nurture talent again at the bottom of pyramid? So there is a great opportunity that we are seeing over there. Plus, uh, if we are talking about all these initiatives, it's it's purely like very impact driven initiative. And probably that's one of the reasons uh, why we are getting deeper into uh, some of these conversations and some of these regions. So that's my take on the importance of technology to build and nurture that entire ecosystem. Uh, last point is that that when we talk about our our reliance on um, uh, international or supply chain reliance on international markets that again is not as as big as compared to the US market. So the Indian reliance of supply chain to international market is somewhere around uh, 12 to 14 percent. If I am not wrong, there was a study that I was I was going through uh, and the US markets reliance to to imports is somewhere around 35 to uh, 42 percent. So basically, when when our government or when we take up that initiative to promote uh, uh, local products in the market, so it's not just about me buying products because they are local, but also it's it's an important responsibility that we all have to take as as digital citizens or good citizens of this country to impart all the knowledge and wisdom so that we can up level all these artisans and weavers on the ground so that they are good enough or ready enough to compete with the global quality standards across the world. So that's my understanding and, and it's, 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 it's a great initiative that Impulse is driving and thank you very much Hasina for inviting me to this conversation. Thank you so much, Rajat. I think you rightly says when you talk about access to information, market, and finance, why technology can help supercharge, you know, a hyper-local business system. And I think post-COVID, that would be the need where a lot of artisans on the ground who are small entrepreneurs, especially women, would be needing that side of mentorship 
that organization like Empower Social Enterprises, Bala, Balipara Foundation, and even Anjali and everyone will have to start relooking and how we are again engaging them to also be able to sell locally beyond taking the product outside and also using technology to uh, connect themselves uh, at the local level for market because many a time that is not possible when they don't know what is the best way to do so. Thank you so much, Rajat, and of course the partnership that Neris, IIE, Impulse Social Enterprises, and Facebook is trying to look for a solution that we can give the best and seeing how we can cope post-COVID in actually upscaling economy and rural livelihood. Thank you. And of course, this is also a, a collaboration that we took over from Crafting Roots with British Council, a continuation of the next series. Thank you for coming. I know you're not well, but I'm really, really happy that you could share your thoughts uh, to all the participants. I just want to mention that uh, the webinar is being live streamed uh, in Facebook, Neris, Impulse Social Enterprise, Impulse NGO Network, uh, Sikkim Express. Uh, so those who could not join in the Zoom, I know they're watching and most of our rural artisans are actually in Facebook Live and sending messages out there. So I'm so excited to see that they are connecting. And that too from villages like Panbari and the Mishing tribes sending updates, you know, so that's really, really nice. Uh, thank you once again, Rajat. And uh, as we move forward, uh, I would like to introduce our next speaker who is joining us from London, uh, Jessica, um, who is a senior consultant at Eduvation for International Relation. Uh, she has worked on a unique and diverse experience in the interaction between education, technology, and art in Europe, US, and Asia. What she'll be sharing today is something really interesting because she worked closely with us a few years ago uh, through uh, a common friend that got us introduced, Bremley uh, Lingdo, who's also on the participant right today, uh, in engaging uh, what she'll be sharing about the intercultural and diverse about how you use Google uh, in introducing. So over to you, Jessica. Hi, thanks for inviting me. I'm actually in Munich, but I'm from England. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, today then, as Hasina said, then I'll be going talking through um, the actual exhibition. I'll just share my screen. Um, so the exhibition uh, from that's actually called Weaving Freedom in Megalia. Um, I hope you can all see that. Um, so this was actually a, a collaboration uh, with the Worldview Impact uh, Foundation, which, um, as Hasina mentioned, then is from, um, it's based in London, but obviously working all over the, the world globally on sustainable issues. Um, and we came to really find um, exactly the kinds of uh, crafts and artisan uh, initiatives that were being done in the name of sustainable fashion and what's important is that um, there have been a range of collaborations with uh, different partners and Google India was looking particularly to um, highlight the different kinds of artisan and artistic craftswomanship um, within these um, within these smaller communities, as has been mentioned um, in the rest of um, the call. So, uh, as you can see here, then uh, the idea was to actually um, not only raise awareness. Uh, within the communities, but also on a global scale, and not many people know about these kinds of artistic sustainable initiatives. So the aim was to really contextualize it by putting um, putting people on the map, literally. Um, and so we have um, highlighted different um, cooperatives. And if I just move this here, so this is. Um, this was a partnership that started in London and then we got in contact with Google India and um, we then I then went um, there and met with Hasina and I'd just like to very briefly show you a small um, excerpt from the video um, which really goes back to what Hasina was saying which is that the actual initiatives not only highlight the sustainable fashion, such as natural dyes and using um, non-synthetic colors, 
um, but also the actual craftswomanship of using symbols that highlight the stories of these tribes and continue the traditions that are often stamped out by larger um, consumer practices or manufacturing practices. So let's just see, hopefully this works. My name is Cecilia Kanti. Um, I'm a founder of a nonprofit organization called Impulse Engine Network, which we are based in Shillong, but we work in eight states of the Northeast of India. Yes, you can use it right now. And I also founded um, a sister concern organization, which is Impulse Social Enterprises, which work with our business to help them to prevent unsafe migration, providing economic livelihood vulnerable communities who have a traditional skill, enhancing their skill so that they have choices in life, not to migrate unsafely. Impulse NGO Network over the last 23 years has focused mainly to, to address the issue of combating child women trafficking. Now, okay, so I just showed you a very small clip. Um, so really to highlight um, the combination of the different symbols that are being used, but then also the kinds of environments that um, artisans are working in. Um, and this is probably well known to many of you on the call, but to um, a rather large amount um, outside of um, mainly globally or in other countries, this is quite maybe unfamiliar in the kinds of environments in which people are working in. Um, we continued the exhibition to really show um, the actual sustainable fabrics such as Eri the silk yarn uh, and traditional colors and really went into detail. Um, this is a done by a photographer, Ivo Taring, who was very um, good at showing the often limited resources uh, that are then being used and actually how long it takes. And this is a big question that um, I think we need to, as fashion entrepreneurs, look into how we can um, look at this particular cottage industry and provide a way to scale this cottage industry because many say, okay, well, this is not sustainable because it takes, um, you know, long and there's limited resources. And so factories are then often favored. But as we have seen, then factories are not sustainable. They're using often um, very unsustainable and the dyes that they're using can also cause cancer. So I think that's a question that I would like to put out to the fashion entrepreneurs listening of how can we look at these different types of um, artisans that are working within the indigenous communities and see how this can be with the role of technology scaled further um, through partnerships, perhaps with Google, perhaps with Facebook or other um, um, corporations that are looking now to explore more sustainable practices um, in particularly in light of what's happened um, and to increase the visibility of this supply chain, which is really giving a, um, these women um, the kinds of livelihoods which is necessary to increase um, the community's um, ability to look after themselves, look after their families, and also to, of course, mitigate human trafficking, which is um, a big issue within the areas. Um, so yeah, this really gives a lot of detail. So as you can see, this is quite um, intuitive. You can slide easily between the different pictures and add in uh, videos. Um, so this is a very effective tool, for example, teaching uh, teaching actually people who, such as the women themselves, the artisans themselves to learn about the dyeing, like go from step by step to see how to use the natural color and how it should be drained. Um, you know, how much heat should be used. Um, so it can be used as a teaching resource um, that can also be done teaching online. So um, if it's, for example, dangerous for um, villages to meet and continue these um, practices at the moment, then there still can be um, awareness about their own practices. And, you know, there can be peer to peer teaching with technology using this resource um, or other or create other resources like this. Um, 
but also furthermore, this can be used as a teaching resource to uh, corporations that want to partner with um, these sustainable uh, practices um, exactly to show what are the advantages of this kind of um, sustainable fashion, uh, the, the way in which uh, there are the dyes that are used are from uh, things like onions or the, the natural environment of the actual village, so it's not harming anything. Um, it fits with, for example, EU law, um, so for the export chain, um, then there are no kind of cancer um, dyes or um, the risk of cancer because it's um, the, uh, the colours are all from natural plants. And so it's not only a teaching resource for the artisans themselves, but also for corporations to enter into partnerships. Um, some of the things that I added in there was actually, I tried to do some of the weaving itself and it was very difficult and I could not do it. Um, and that was just to help people to realize, particularly within the partnerships of corporations or um, governments, how difficult this particular skill is to really show that these women are not just you know workers they're actually skilled trained um, artisans with a very complex uh, craft that they've mastered and that they can do quickly they can do something like this within an hour which is incredible because i was taking nearly half an hour to figure out how to just stretch the, <laughs> the cloth um, and so really again that's highlighting the skill and the enormous amount of craft that these women have learned and that is being scaled within the particular communities so those are a bit of the finished products. Um, so this can be used for marketing out to um, actually the shops, the retailers across the world and you know, very high quality photos there um, to really showcase the beauty and, um, and, and how they can go in across the world into different markets uh, in Europe, in the States, in Asia and so on. Um, so yes, yeah, so I just highlighted different kinds of communities. Um, the one that you just saw was in Udem here, and here you see us, you know, with the Assamese tribe. Um, <clears throat> and as um, there are foundations also that could get involved, uh, Hans Guggenheim is particularly um, advocating for the uh, technological innovation of the arts, um, particularly emphasizing that there needs to be a need for continuity. So as mentioned before, the, the patterns that are within the actual, um, within the fabrics themselves show the continuity of the cultural traditions. And this is very different from say mass. And as you can see here, Hasina is um, talking with the Mishing tribe about the different patterns. So that helps not only to continue the communities, um, uh, in the outside world, but also it helps with their mental health, with their well-being, to understand um, that their generations are being continued. Um, so there's no risk of them perhaps, you know, turning to other forms of um, satisfaction, which may be a bit more harmful to their own livelihoods. Um, so it's, it's very good for building up social confidence and uh, meaning within their own lives, which is important uh, within communities. Uh, so yeah, so that gives you a bit of an overview. Also, what I would recommend is um, for entrepreneurs who are wanting to support these, uh, to support these um, smaller indigenous artisan communities is to think about when you're communicating to perhaps a wider audience to show also the um, ways in which the clothes are used, particularly for ceremonies. So a bit more of the traditions and so on and to emphasize that these are not sort of meaningless or tourist, just tourist kind of, um, you know, tourist celebrations, but they're also actually intrinsic to the culture itself. Mm -hmm. um, and in that way, the more exposure that there can be of it being linked rather than separate, then people can understand um, how important it is for these particular, uh, the continuity of these traditions. Um, so yeah, that's, that's really, mainly what I have to say. Um, so I would suggest that what is important is for entrepreneurs to look at how we can use this kind of technology, not only as a teaching resource, but also as a marketing resource to work with partnerships with corporations, foundations, government entities, um, with development funds, 
and also to you know go through i will put the exhibitions in the chat so you can go through about how these are set out um, and look for yourself uh, ways of using this particular platform and also creating your own platforms um, that have this very media rich um, capability to support the artisan supply chain, teaching um, and partnerships. So I hope that helps a little bit to give um, an idea and I'd be happy to answer any questions that come up. Thank you, Jessica. I think uh, you rightly put this, the women from different tribes are not just workers, but women who are skilled and trained artisans. So this is a very important element that when we look at artisans, we cannot look at them as workers or laborers. They are artists by their own right. They are artisans, they are entrepreneurs, and that's how Impulse and Power look at uh, most of the artisans that we're working, that they are entrepreneurs from their own right, and uh, they're weaving from their own home. They choose their time, but there's a richness of livelihood engagement within the ecosystem and also with living within their own environment, which is a very important part of the process when we talk about craft and textile. Thank you so much uh, for sharing your thoughts and also putting uh, the link to the chat so that the uh, participants who are actually uh, part of, you know, who are in this joining in this webinar at the moment can actually uh, have more detailed reading. And uh, you can also answer some of the questions uh, which is already uh, popping up in the chat box. Uh, to different speakers as uh, it's being, uh, you know, completed. I also want to mention that uh, our team, uh, I would like to thank Bhagashri and uh, Shritapa, who is actually tweeting right now and, you know, giving a live tweet of every speaker's input uh, to go in as a further discussion from the Nehru Summit, uh, which is being taken uh, forward jointly in a collaboration right now. Thank you once again, Jessica. And, uh, we, I would like to ask Namrata if there's a possibility to try uh, to show the video of uh, Omi again uh, once more, if we can look at that. Yeah. Ma'am, we'll just share the screen once again. Okay, so we'll just share the screen once again. Namaste. Did you know that fashion industry, second most productive industry in the world, and fashion can save the environment? Today, the issue faced by the fashion industry is at its worst. We are facing enormous carbon dioxide emission, uh, air, uh, water pollution, increase in the use of chemical products, the disposal of hazardous waste products and land uses, and the list goes on. As a consumer, if you buy and wear clothes, you are part of this industry. So how can we, through fashion, save the environment? The answer is simple, by being sustainable, by being a conscious consumer of fashion. Sustainable fashion is an ethical fashion that has a positive impact on environment, society, and economy at large. However, today we are buying up to four times more clothes than what we did few years ago, exploiting people and resources. It is said that we only wear 20% of our clothes, 80% of our time, and 95% 95% of textile waste and landfills can be reused or recycled. So we need to be conscious, buy less, wear more, and take care of your clothes. For example, investing in sari or handloom sari, a good handloom sari is a good investment because it can fit all sides and it can be passed from one generation to another. So, we need to learn to take care of our clothes. It is said that extending the life cycle of clothing by uh, nine months can reduce 
carbon and water and waste footprint by 20 to 30 percent. And it is also said that 25 percent of carbon footprint as a clothing uh, depends on the way we take care of them. Coco Chanel, a French fashion designer, once said, fashion is not something that exists only in dresses. Fashion is in the sky, in the street, in the way we live. Fashion has to do with idea, and fashion is what is happening. This pandemic, this coronavirus pandemic, is an opportunity to reset ourselves and shift towards being more sustainable. We need to adopt a sustainable lifestyle. Uh, and you know, this lockdown has taught us to slow down. The world, when we didn't slow down, we could see improved air quality and we could hear the birds shake again. Um, according to Center for Research of Energy and Clean Air, stated that for the first time, India's carbon dioxide emission did fall down uh, since 1982. So it is. Uh, a good news for the environment. Uh, we really need to adopt a very sustainable lifestyle. Few things we can do is uh, carry a reusable bag. Uh, you know, start reusing uh, your waste products. Learn to compost your food waste, and um, you know. For example, small lifestyle changes like replacing uh, incandescent bulbs with LED light. There's are a few things. You can uh, reuse your waste in different ways. You can make wonderful gifts out of it and gifts to people. Uh, you can grow your own herbs and your veggies. You need to follow four R principles that is First, you need to refuse, you need to reduce, you need to reuse, and you need to recycle. It is said that the big changes happen when people do little things consistently. So as a consumer, uh, you have the power to choose and you have the power to change. Sustainability is in your hands. And only when nature thrives, does humanity survive? Uh, I would like to say that do not bring in your house anything that is not useful or that is not beautiful. We need to be a conscious consumer because if we do not take care, if we do not learn, learn from this pandemic, the things could be worse. We need to be a conscious consumer and be more sustainable. Thank you. So I think uh, what what Omi has mentioned there in terms of being a of being a more conscious customer is a strong message as the last speaker of this webinar today. But before we uh, come to a close, uh, seeing the amount of chat and question, and I'm I'm very happy to see Saurav Malhotra who is trying to reply most of it. Can I call upon you, Saurav, to just sum up some of those questions that has come from uh, the different participants? If you could just sum up uh, in few words uh, for the others as well who are actually not uh, sending the messages on the chat. Sure, sure, Athena. So I think uh, there have been a few really per pertinent questions, a few overlapping questions. So let me just summarize and say two points. So I think one very, very important point, which I think a lot of your work, Hasina, also covers is looking at, at migration. So there's one question about uh, actually enhancing or enhancing re-migration back to rural areas or preventing rural to urban migration. And how can we enhance that? How can we prevent rural to urban migration? I think some of the main aspects here, and I can speak here from the work that we do at the Balipara Foundation is if there are opportunities in rural areas, people come back. So I think the only main reason, unless it is forced for people to move to urban areas is employment and is the economics of employment. So if there are employment opportunities in rural areas, people typically tend to move back to rural areas. Cost of living is less and the quality of life is higher. In our experience, just by having possibilities of jobs, 
and it, it is up to us the kind of jobs we create we can create sustainable jobs it is up to us to create jobs that actually promote conservation of the environment and not the other way around but as long as there's jobs people come back so so all you need for people to come back is just opportunities and i think no no amount of awareness or capacity building will work unless there's an opportunity um another point is on fashion recycling fashion and uh, the, the pollution from the fashion industry so i think it is becoming easier now to recycle your clothes to recycle your products there's 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 many innovative designers entrepreneurs um, taking it taking it upon themselves to accept your old clothes to recreate something new for yourself and the choice is yours i've i've put down a few names of a few options uh people links their instagram links that that could actually help you and the question of actually microplastic pollution into ocean so we must understand that, that that is actually a big problem so over 80% of all the microplastics in oceans is actually from the textile industry this happens because of poor quality synthetics or because of poor quality synthetics that are mixed into hand woven natural fabrics the only way that we can prevent that is by ensuring that synthetic fabrics are of a higher quality and that you recycle them into non wearable products before the end time because after a few washes they naturally tend to degrade and give out microplastics uh but this is a larger issue you know this issue is large which which will be changed once consumer appetites change and once large corporations so we need guys like facebook and google to come on and join hands in this revolution to to try and make this whole industry much much more sustainable thanks thanks Thank you so much, Saurav. I think you sum up beautifully by putting all the answers uh, together of uh, many of the participant. Yes, I know Facebook has already come on board, and that's how this whole process of the partnership for the North East has evolved. And uh, we're very thankful to IIE, Indian Institute of Entrepreneurship, Dr. Shipana, Dr. Abhijit Sharma, for this collaboration that we see how an ecosystem, and I think uh, organization like Bali Para Foundation and us, can play that role yeah. of bringing together yeah. the whole understanding why the environment is important and also for yeah. us why migration can actually be uh, you know be given a choice not to migrate if there is a yeah. livelihood back home uh, exactly. i also would like to call on jessica i think there was some question that has come up that you might want uh, to flag a little bit from your side jessica Sure. Um I'm just trying to look through um I can't see any question directed to me so if you see it please let me know. Can you hear me okay? Oh, I can't hear you. Can you turn yourself off mute? Uh if you uh, there has been general question that has come up in terms yes. of, you know, uh what you spoken earlier as well so maybe you could just yep. give some of your thoughts uh mm -hmm. that could actually uh you know um can actually mm -hmm. enlighten them more you know in terms of how they could take it forward hence post covid okay um so yeah um sorry i'm just trying to look i didn't see um the direct question but i basically um how can you take it forward then i think the best thing is to look for partnerships so for example like contacting google india for example um and using the resource that's already on there um it's called uh, weaving freedom in megalia it's got i've put the um the actual link in the chat and i'll put in um the other one the other exhibition as well so you can actually contact different partners such as google india but also um, other corporations, other foundations, other um, government initiatives where people can use this uh, as a resource, as a teaching tool uh, to show both entrepreneurs um, who are wanting to expand their supply chain uh, to export to other areas, both locally, but also internationally and across India. And also to show the importance of the different combinations that are at work. So it's not only about the actual textiles themselves, but also the, the ways in which the um, plants are being used, the need for more um, silk uh, mulberry brush, sorry, the mulberry brushes, and the um, 
the support around the airy weaving um, with the silkworms and also the importance of providing support uh, for the cooperative societies. So, for example, um, one of the um, cooperative societies started off themselves and then once it was seen how successful that this uh, cooperative society in Udem in the Roy Boy district um, was actually being, then the government then put their backing behind it. So by using the technology itself and the media rich technology, because of course it shows um, the beauty of the textiles and the craft as well and the skill that's needed, use those resources to go to government organizations, to go to corporations, to go to Google foundations as well. Um, you can use the resource that I've put up there gladly um, and to, to promote that these artisans um, need that support or if you want to start your own cooperative um, but then also for the te as a teaching resource. So the resource that I've put in the chat can be used to teach how the skill is actually done. And that can be done at home whilst we're all in lockdown, um, but then also to show how it can continue after lockdown um, and, and also to uh, raise awareness and have discussions around the specific areas, such as how does the dye work? How is it? Um, but then think of other solutions, like at the moment the dye takes quite long and you have to gather a lot of firewood. Um, so the, the scalability is quite difficult. So maybe we can start a conversation about um, how can we um, perhaps increase maybe the efficiency, um, maybe the speed in which those uh, dyes can be uh, put together because there have been a lot of questions about, well, we're not going to invest in this because it's it takes too long. But the importance of these um, communities to use these sustainable practices is more important than say big factories that are using non uh, that are using synthetic dyes or um, where they're using dye that's not azo free, which is actually against regulations in the EU and people won't buy them. So um, it's really about using that tech resource, the media rich resource to have discursive practices around that, use it as a um, teaching resource for entrepreneurs and the artisans themselves, but then also to go into schools as well to teach the younger generation um, about these kinds of cooperatives and how they can create livelihoods. So um, those are a few ideas and yeah, also as a marketing tool to get more funding and start <clears throat> or getting investment. You know, there are lots of women's funds, even in the West, like, you know, in, in America or in Europe that um, are now starting to fund women's initiatives, um, say in India. So, you know, really look big, look wide and use the resources that I've put there um, as much as possible. Thank you, uh, Jessica. Thank you very much for that. Uh, we are okay to open questions to our participant, uh, which uh, they can actually unmute uh, and then ask a question uh, to any of the speakers who have spoken. Anyone out there who would like to uh, pose a question directly who have not sent uh, any feedback on the chat or any Any of the participants, you can actually uh, ask a question directly. Hello. Hi, Tina. Hi, Huma. Hi. How are you? I'm good. I'm good, Huma. Okay. Uh, yes. So this question is for Jessica. Uh, Jessica, I have a jewelry label and um, I tied up with Hasina right before the lockdown to uh, take my label sustainable. Um, I was wondering if you work with any artisans uh, who are part of the Khasi tribe who make this jewellery. I saw it feature prominently uh, in the pictures that you shared. Yeah. Yeah, so that's a good question. I mean, if you have like a particular, um, if you want to send some pictures because it's a dynamic resource. Um, so the two exhibitions that I showed you, one of them was um, particularly about weaving. Um, there is the other one which is about the particularly about Kazi tribe um, which I posted in the chat as well um, and it's a dynamic resource so I can add to it. So if you have, if you're from the Kazi tribe then this can be added to the wisdom of Kazi women um, 
I could possibly add it to the weaving freedom, although that was mainly about um, weaving, but I'm sure that I can add, you know, if it's, you know, about sustainable jewelry. Um, and so, yeah, if there is, if there are more people that are particularly from the different tribes that would like to highlight their work in this resource, then please do send me um, your links um, and your, um, I'll, I'll leave my LinkedIn profile and um, some high resolution pictures and I can actually add to it. And so, because it's a dynamic creative resource. So um, if you would, yeah, so that's, I've put my uh, LinkedIn there. So just, um, um, you know, add, add me on LinkedIn and then you can send the uh, high resolution pictures which can be added to the, di to the resource. Um, sure, thank you. So my question actually was uh, whether you work with artisans who are making this jewelry. I'm not Kashi, I'm from Assam. Oh, sorry. I'm based, I know that's all right. I'm based out of Delhi, and uh, so I, since I'd recently tied up with Hasina's organization, I was looking for artisans that I could tie up with in the Northeast to make okay. my jewelry. Yeah, so I already run a contemporary jewelry label, but I wanted to uh, take it sustainable and tie up. I give it a north, like tie up with people in the Northeast. Okay, so, that, you, yeah. so you basically want to connect with artisans um, in order yeah. to work. With yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. No, that's that's um that's great. I mean, just um with the Worldview Impact Foundation that I'm working with, then um they're based you know in London and Shillong. So um you can contact me through the Worldview Impact Foundation, and then we can put you sure. in contact um with these artisans that you would like to work with. Um, okay. okay. I'll also put my Worldview Impact email there and um, yeah, and then we can connect you with the artisans uh, within the region. Sure, sounds good. Thank you. Thank you so much. Th thank you, Huma. Uh, anyone thank else you, among the participant who would like to ask a question to any of our panelists? Anyone else out there who would like to pose a question? Hello. Hello. Yeah. Hi, this is Varima. I'm speaking from Delhi. Am I audible? Yes. Yes. You are audible. Hi. So uh, anybody from the panelists can answer this question. So um, since we all know that because of this pandemic and um, all of these situations, there's a lot of reverse migration which is happening and a lot of artisans are going back to their own hometowns who were actually working in different states and uh, earning their livelihood. So just from a very different perspective of opening a social enterprise, what what could be your field right now for these artisans to get into? Like if I want to get into uh, livelihood generation, then it would be like, it's not possible to do a skill mapping of all the artisans which come back to one, like any of the states. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you can carry on. You can carry on. Yeah, so I just wanted to know that what would be, like, what is the need of the R right now? That how can we provide them with livelihood opportunities just considering the Atmanirbhar scheme or the MSME scheme? And we, like, how can I help them to, like, give them, provide them with livelihood opportunities? Can I request any of the panelists uh, to answer? Who would like to answer that? Dr. Kostov, are you there? Uh, Dr. Shiparna from uh, IIE, would you like to answer that? I mean, I, I can jump in and just like maybe to provide like a quick idea. Um, one of the ways that you could um, help provide a livelihood, particularly if it's in lockdown, is to show um, how there can be um, e-commerce um, so training. So, for example, um, using kind of media rich resources to then create your own platform 
um, whether that be a exhibition or actually an exhibition linked then with an e-commerce um, shop, which enables people internationally to buy um, the artwork that um, has been created already. Um, you know, obviously, because it's very difficult during lockdown to keep creating um, during this time. So really um, using like, I think it's important to teach others how to do the e-commerce platforms and to do like the very media rich um, exhibitions which showcase oh, people's work. Nice um, so that can provide like a, a, a livelihood um, which uh, is like an online business in a way, a sustainable business um, during lockdown from everybody's homes. Um, so I think it's about like connecting with people who perhaps have good design skills, who can help others who are, have uh, the artisan skills to then like um, teach them how to take the photographs, teach them within their own homes, teach them how to put that online and then teach them how to create the e-commerce side of that. Um, and that can be something that's done right now. I will add here. Uh... We are a charitable trust in uh, Chennai, it's in South India. And uh, as you rightly said, there are a lot of um, uh, migrant workers who are moving in. So one easy way to understand what they can do is to understand from where they are coming. Like if they're moving out from a cluster which is into textile, you already know that they are used to with doing certain textile activities because we already have the clusters mapped. So if you can do that, what we are trying to do is basically we are connecting them from uh, our home to their home. It's easy now. You can even do a WhatsApp call and just check what they are interested into because there's a lot of demand in masks and that's exactly what we are doing at this moment. And that can be done at home. It can be hand-stitched. It can be hand-built. And a basic product like a bag or a mask, something as that, can be even produced at home at the artisan side. And it can be picked up safely by the retailers because the retailers knows how to pick it up. They are picking services. So I think there's a very homebound products which are going to come. And most interesting product which will be requiring uh, a base uh, of producers for next six months at least because COVID is not going to move before September, October, November. So till December, there will be a need of a mask. And mask is one of the easiest products to make at this scenario. And anybody can make it at home. So if you can have a logistic system to pick them up, or drop them from the end of the resource. It is easy to produce products like a mask or a bag or something which they can use, an individual product. And that can be something which can be done if you can map from where they are coming and what they can do. Basics. Yep. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Jessica and uh, Mr. Seen Gupta. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, so before I think we are also coming in to almost a closing time of this webinar, uh, I will take one one more last question. Uh, I mean, if there's anyone else who would like to shoot a question to any of the panelists. Uh, my name is Shaukar. I have posted a question uh, on the chat. Can you read it out? Yeah. While we all are uh, in earnest, are working toward conservation of local art and artisans towards sustainable future, are we working to classify archiving and securing the large pool of database and information so that they are not misused or diluted? Do we have an ownership in this initiative? Um, Dr. Kostov, would you like to uh, answer that question? Uh being a designer, I think uh, we do have a responsibility to archive what we are doing or from where we are doing. Uh, uh, but I think there is a necessity for organizations as, as this where we are talking today to archive data because we are lacking a lot of information and which I have also uh, informed ministry that we lack resources. That's a big problem for us because we don't archive and i think that's a very important point for archiving because our history is not archived properly our crafts are not archived properly so there is a, already a procedure of archiving the crafts there is a recipitary it's in process under minister of textiles and handicrafts which i am part of it so we are trying to archive as much data as possible including basic data of geotagging a, a, a artisan and we knowing from where to where the artisan is moving so geotagging is also getting done we are also incorporating AI artificial intelligence to find out which locations it's merchantly moving. But yes, a bigger organization like Google and Facebook can also help us or uh, the organizations to archive data 
that's very important at that moment. Yes, that's required at this time. And also, and also, is there a, a initiative going on on the non-disclosure? Because let's say, for example, you are a designer, you have designed some motifs which are absolutely uh, 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 in your domain and you don't want it to be cloned. And uh, in, in a synthetic world, it's very easy to clone and go to the market. And uh, whereas, you know, art and artisans uh, being from the rural environment, they don't have the resource to uh, quick fire their production. So this is where, uh, uh, do you think that non-disclosure is a very uh, important instrument? Uh, in more than non-disclosure, I think what is important is to ensure that the artisans are understanding the copyright laws and basic trademark laws and understanding the you know, GI laws. Government has a provision to register. I think most of the crafts are under register. I have worked for two crafts in registration. We have got the GI registration. But uh, let me tell you, the design registration is a very flimsy act. Because if we can change 30 elements of a design, it immediately becomes a new design. And changing 30 elements in a basic accessories or a fashion product is easy. But what we uh, need to understand that we cannot hold on. This is, this is a, this I'm stressing again because this is not a world to hold on. This is a world to leave, but to move agile. So we have to produce much more innovative products further. So we cannot hold on, but yes, we need to do archiving. And we need to do a lot of geographical indication registrations to keep our design safe. I'll give an example of what happened to one of my uh, friend called Origin. He runs a, a design studio in uh, uh, Goa. And uh, he had a big, uh, uh, had a big fight with a Christian Dior. You must be knowing that. That they are a small element, but Christian Dior copied. Uh, Christian Dior copied, and then they fought, and uh, uh, Origit and his team own it. Own the, and it has settled now. But in this case, what we require is to be vigilant. If somebody is copying, there is already a legal action can be taken. And organizations can be helping the uh, artisans to do proper legal procedures to fight against biggest, bigger corporates if needed. Uh, that's what is important because we don't take care of that part. So organizations should do that as part. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Costa. Uh, if uh, Anjali Sharma, would you like to add up any, any of your thoughts to that question, being somebody who is also doing a lot of exports uh, of you know, products, uh, I mean, woven by artisans? Anjali, are you there? I think she's, lose, uh, she's just lost us. So uh, without any delay, uh, first and foremost, I would like to uh, take uh, the privilege uh, to actually thank each of the speakers. I think it's been an amazing sharing. I mean, uh, from Saurav Malhotra, who enhanced the craft and textile towards livelihood conservation. He stressed about conservation as the major important when it comes to uh, the larger process of climate change and issues that we are talking today especially sustainability. Uh, of course, Omi, who had sent uh, that video, was very, very strongly about being conscious. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kostov Sengupta. Uh, amazingly, a very good research in-depth presentation uh, about what should be the kind of design post-COVID and how does designer can work in a collaborative ecosystem in recreating and not working alone. Uh, Rajat Arora, from the Facebook, of course, uh, who have come on board. I mean, Facebook uh, has come on board to partner with Impulse Social Enterprise in the endeavor of our initiative of collaborating with Indian Institute of Entrepreneurship and also to answer a few of the question that we are bringing together a kind of a data bank of uh, trying to understand uh, the kind of work that, artists, uh, that a lot of entrepreneurs are doing in the Northeast of India. And of course, our team from Australia, Tatum Street also had join uh, and she is basically the one who is documenting and taking this uh, research further on behalf of the organization. Uh, Jessica Kennedy, thank you so much uh, for sharing those thoughts uh, and, and how things work in terms of how you showcase art and culture on the technology platform. And I'm uh, uh, looking at your story from the textile of the Northeast India. 
And of course, a question, I know that our partners who are on the ground, uh, who are listening and who are also, I think the main leaders uh, out there collaborating with artisans, you know, from Nagaland Hamso, we had Pishak, we had Nandini out there. Uh, and we had like Jayanta way back working with another communities uh, way back in North Bengal. So it's, it's, it's been a pool of, of different people. And of course, many others who I don't know, but who have joined in into listening to this uh, webinar. And I would like to say that they could share uh, at, you know, the, the Facebook Live, which will, is available in the Neris Facebook page, Impulse Social Enterprises, Impulse NGO Network, uh, which is available. And so that wider audiences can get uh, you know, more awareness who have missed this webinar today or who could not join because of technology or internet connection, uh, at least will get value. And we at Impulse Social Enterprise uh, are also going to be happy to answer more questions if they can just send it to our Facebook page uh, so that you know uh, anything which is left or unanswered today in this webinar uh, will be answered. Uh, with that, I will call upon uh, Dr. Abhijit Sharma, the Director of Indian Institute of Entrepreneurship, you know, the strong pillar uh, along, you know, who have been there in taking this NERIS with the collaboration and teamwork of the team at IIE, Dr. Shipana and every team behind uh, to give his concluding remarks. I think uh, Director Sir is not there. Uh, we have Shiparna come. Shiparna. So I call upon Dr. Shiparna, uh, if you can give your concluding remarks. Yeah. Thank you, Hasina. I think it was a wonderful pers new perspective been coming up. But there's been so many webinars being organized on the table. I don't think there's been anything done for Northeast and the sustainable fashion and sustainability. So I think from that perspective and new ideas which have come in, I'm sure the participants have gained a lot. This has also given us a new perspective about how we look at, you know, uh, uh, look at look at sustainable fashion, sustainable, um, look at sustainability in have, you know, textiles. So I think uh, this um, collaboration that we are, you know, thinking about, we've just collaborated in NERIS. Uh, we definitely going to work ahead with Impulse, with all the network which has come in today. And I'm sure this is going to give a new direction. Also a lot of hope to people from the textile and handloom sector as to how they can look at, relook at textiles. Thank you so much. And thank you all the panelists for being with us. Thank you, everybody, and thank you all participants who had stayed on to listen to all the speakers. Uh, and you can keep on looking at the NERIS site, uh, Impulse Social Enterprise site, uh, for more updates of the upcoming webinar and more information that we could provide to each and everyone. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, Hasina, everyone else. Thank you. Bye-bye.